great pleasure to be here, and I do want to uh, give my particular thanks both to uh, Sri Harder and uh, Trinity Forum, and also to the CAID, my first and delightful experience of this uh, new and thrilling institution, and particularly to, uh, to Phoebe and uh, Richard Miles and the vision which lies behind what is being built here. Uh, this is, it is a, a, great, a great privilege, and uh, I, I am, uh, I'm somewhat overwhelmed to be, to be invited to be part of, of this very special evening. What I'd like to do as we address this question of fear and flourishing is to pick up three themes. I, I was uh, looking through the long list of the many reasons to be fearful, the many challenges to flourishing in the context of the emerging robotics AI agenda. And I came up with three. Um, but before we look at them, I want to make a couple of general comments about this discussion in which we are all of us engaged. I mean, one, of course, is to ask the question, well, what is a robot? And, uh, you know, we have sort of, you know, hands sort of, you can imagine the rest of the, the robot body here behind the screen. Um, we plainly have robots, if you like, that look like robots. I mean, we all know what a robot looks like. It looks like a robot. Well, of course, it isn't quite so simple. Because all a robot is, a robot that looks like a robot, is a sort of delivery mechanism, a piece of engineering to deliver uh, some programming, to deliver the results of AI, algorithms, whatever terms you want to use here. It's interesting, actually, that the Japanese, who have, of course, been global leaders in robotics, have been almost fixated with producing robots that look like robots, in other words, that look rather human. And most people haven't been bothered about this at all. Um, but we all know what a robot. But of course, there are all sorts of things that do the same thing that these machines do, which we need to put in exactly the same category. I mean, you know, when you sit in the bath, as I have more than once, and riskily pull up your smartphone to book, a, book an air trip, you know, and start pressing buttons, and, you know, you engage the banks, and you engage your credit card, and you engage the airlines, and you search, and so on, and after a few minutes, bingo, you've got a ticket. This is a robot. I mean, the principle of AI robotics is engineering to deliver programming, hardware to deliver software. You can put it how you want. You can talk about this. Well, the, the catchphrase for a long time has been the Internet of Things for what has been called ubiquitous computing. Uh, little devices all over the world and big devices all over the world all plugged into each other, a kind of big global single robot which is being built. And which, according to McKinsey and all these smart people, uh, within a decade or so will yield 10, 15 percent of the global economy. Um, all right, so I think it's important that we don't get fixated with the robots that look like robots that look like people and recognize that we're talking about programming, very powerful programming, using machines to connect with the physical world. Second comment to make is about the pace of change. Now, many of you will know all about Moore's Law, or you'll know something about Moore's Law. Um, named for Gordon Moore, the famous founder of Intel Corporation, you know, Intel Inside, Intel Corporation. Not quite as sort of sexy an organization as the new tech companies, but part of the bedrock of this entire revolution. And Gordon Moore, way back in 1965, he didn't realize he was writing Moore's Law. He wrote a very short article for a sort of technology newsletter. And he observed the phrase he used was, we can now cram twice as many circuits onto a chip every year. That was the phrase he used. It was a newsletter. And about 10 years later, he went to find, well, maybe it's every two years we can cram. And other people have come up with other versions of more, maybe 18 months and so on. And of course, you can also tie this in with questions of cost. And of course, our experience is that every year these devices get faster and faster and broadly speaking, cheaper. And now there are big questions about Moore's Law and you know, whether we're going to get into barriers and all so on. But, 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 but the point is, 50 years ago, the, our capacities were a trillion times, something like that, less than they are now. And as you know, these little things you have in your pocket, far more powerful than the computers they used to send people to the moon, back when we believed in going to the moon, you know, back, back in the 1960s that it's this extraordinary revolution in our capacity for computing which means that this AI robotics algorithmic 
mechanical thing is now so very potent and becoming so much more potent year by year. So, of course, you know, the classic thing is an exponential curve. It goes up faster, faster, faster. It isn't just that every year these things get cheaper and faster. Every year they get cheaper and faster more than they did last year. So the, these are the two, two basic points, it seems to me, we need to have out there in our thinking. Now, I'm sure some of you are, you know, big computer scientists. I'm sure some of you have never heard of Moore's Law. We, we have a, something of a mixed group this evening, and I'm hoping we can all learn something from each other as we move along. I'm going to begin by talking a bit about jobs, which is the obvious area where there's a lot of fear, or there's some fear. Out. I remember sitting in, a, in Menlo Park, California, you know, which is Silicon Valley um, um, ground zero, uh, having lunch, a very elegant lunch, open air uh, restaurant um, with the two top partners in a you know uh, white shoe law firm in their Silicon Valley uh, branch. So they open the conversation. The senior partner opens the conversation, and he said, "You know what I want to talk about, Nigel? I want to talk about when we will next get involved with a company which will create jobs rather than destroy them." And as I say in the book, you know, you could knock me down with a chip. They were raising this question. You try to raise the question. I've talked to AFL-CIO about this. I've talked to the UK equivalent, the TUC. I've talked to governments in DC, in London, in Ottawa, elsewhere, trying to get people's attention at a high level to the potential implications of the end of full employment, because that is what we're talking about. It's a challenge. And it really interests me that the labor unions aren't bothered about this. I mean, you would think that's what they were paid to be bothered about. And so part of what I've been doing over these last few years is trying to think to myself, how do I account for this? As well as, how can I seek in some small way to change it? Not because I am convinced that full employment will come to an end. Now, just to, to define things, as you know. Full employment is a rather vague term used by economists. It doesn't mean everyone has a job. It means that pretty much everybody who wants a job can probably get one. It's something like that. So unemployment, you know, is 3, 4, 5, 8, 9 percent, something like that. Uh, you need a few percent unemployment so the economy can get itself sorted out, and we're pretty much up there now. There's no economic law that says, give me an economy and I will give you full employment. The main thing governments do, they won't quite tell you this, especially not the US government, because it doesn't like to think it's always fussing around with the economy. The main thing governments do, apart from having national defense, is to mess around with the economy to ensure people have jobs before the next election. And governments are forever fussing around with the economy to try to make sure we retain something like full employment and the economy doesn't overheat and so on and so all the things that we know. That's what governments, it's a huge task of, of modern governments. And it's why, in industrial economies, there has been something like full employment for our lifetimes. And it's something of a miracle it's been achieved. And there's absolutely no economic law that says it has to be the case in five years' time. Now, obviously, you can look at these various areas where jobs are under threat. What interests me, I mean, if you're trying to challenge a consensus, and there's a consensus out there that this isn't a problem. It's a pretty strong consensus. And Bill Gates, as you may know, a few years ago began talking about this. He said governments will soon be pleading with companies to employ people rather than machines. He said it's a reason not to raise the minimum wage. He said governments should think of taxing robots, partly so, of course, companies aren't so motivated to get rid of people and replace them by machines, and partly, of course, because governments need to capture tax from where value is being added. There was a comment made about Davos just a day or two ago, which I saw, uh, that in public, of course, all of these people were talking a bit about this issue and saying, oh, well, we need to make sure people have employment. And in private, they were all discussing how to get rid of workers and replace them with, with machines. And of course, in, when you look at it from a business point of view, an economic point of view, um, it's not so much machines, it's capital. You're replacing human resources with capital resources. And there's the prospect there of a shift in which this balance between the different means of production um, turns into one in which capital has a bigger and bigger role and humans have less and less. Now, I mean, I don't know. And the reason I wrote the book was to argue that 
we have to take a risk-based approach. We don't know, so we draw a risk matrix and we all plot a point where we think, you know, the level of threat plainly is enormous. I mean, if this happens, it's an absolute catastrophe. So impact, pretty clear, we can agree on that. Likelihood, we will disagree. And then we begin working on factors for mitigation and so on, as one does in, 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 in risk management situations. Secondly, I came across Larry Summers. Now, Larry Summers is one of the most flamboyant figures in American public life. I actually met him briefly once, but I'm sure he didn't think he met me, but we did speak briefly, and off he went. Uh, he's, a, <laughs> he's quite a character. Um, and as you know, he was Clinton's Treasury Secretary, President of Harvard, and so on. He made a very interesting speech, and he's not someone who's given to saying he's wrong. Very interesting speech, uh, maybe three, three, four years ago, in which he said that when he was at MIT, um, there, there were two groups of students who would talk about this kind of stuff. And he said, um, one group were the, uh, the sort of smart kids, you know, who thought, no problem, technology is wonderful, blah, blah. Then he said, you had the stupid Luddites, Luddite kids. He said, I now think the stupid Luddite kids may have been right. And thirdly, just to balance this out, Charles Murray. Now, Charles Murray is less well-known than Larry Summers, but he's probably even more controversial. Major conservative intellectual, writing in the Wall Street Journal in favor of some sort of basic income. Because in 20 years' time, it's hard to believe Americans, in general, will earn their living by having full-time jobs like they do now. I say all that. Um, <laughs> reasons for fear. A couple of little facts before we move on. One is that, um, as an example of this, Kodak, remember Kodak, you know, <coughs> Kodak, still just about exists as a corporation, it's kind of selling off its IP. Uh, Rochester, New York, classic example of, sort of, you know, town built around a huge corporation. At one point, it employed more than 140,000 people, corporate, quite apart from all the shops all over the world doing your photos. And it was replaced in our cultural and economic life by what? By Instagram. When Instagram was taken over by Facebook um, for a billion dollars, it had 13 employees. 13. You think a bit about the capital allocated to the jobs and so on, okay? And just to... <laughs> Just to make you realize it isn't, you know, that isn't a total exception, WhatsApp, also taken over by Facebook, um, for $19 billion, had 55 employees. So, you know, go think about the new ways in which the economy is generating value, providing services for consumers, involving hardly any people at all. And then you talk about the cars and the trucks and so on, as we have before. I mean, th these are very serious questions. Now, what do we do? Well, the fun thing, first thing to do <laughs> is to say to your children and grandchildren, as I do, you need to come up with a plan in which you can build a career or more than one set of skills for yourself, which are not readily convertible into the work of machines. Some of you will know, study by Oxford University's uh, Futures Project uh, came out 2013, listing over 700 different jobs, going through them all one by one, and reckoned that 47% of jobs would be gone in about 20 years. You can look at this list, and you can look at the, the, the calculations that they use, um, and you can look where the jobs lie. And the, the tech jobs go first. Don't all go and learn to be a programmer, because these are the things that are most readily to be done by machines in not very long. Entrepreneurship, creativity, inventiveness, this is a K motto here. Um, inter, in, in, human interaction, physical therapy, um, counseling, although some counseling is now computer based. Um, look at the things which are most seriously human and least easy to convert into algorithms. If you look to flourish, uh, I think there's a a non, the phrase I use from the book, is a non-trivial chance of the end of full employment. So in either 20 years or maybe 40 years, a whole lot of people do not have typical full-time jobs. 
One of the issues is how you pay these people. And they will be paid even in economies like the US, which don't like talking about socialism and transfers and so on, because you have to have demand and you have to have votes. And they both require people to have, to have, to have money. The real problem is going to be what you do with your time. And so I say to my children and grandchildren, train and prepare yourself for having a lot more time in which to do things that are not directly economic in their benefit to you. I had a student come up to me after a, a lecture in a university recently, and she said, are you saying that when we graduate at the age of 22, we will retire? <laughs> and I said, I couldn't have put it better. <laughs> Secondly, who is my neighbor? This is a very different kind of question, and we'll address it much more briefly, but I think it is a, it is a question which is welling up. Um, we all watch movies, we watch Netflix dramas, and so on, um, and it's when you see the narrative that you really get drawn in to the existential, the, I mean, the, 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 inter, the personal questions being raised by the emergence of intelligences, which have some of the aspects of being human, but we know are not. And of course, the most, the most striking of these is, uh, is Westworld. How many of you have been watching Westworld? Westworld, the TV series, or Westworld, the original movie? Oh my goodness, well, you people need to go do something tonight. <sighs> Westworld, the original, was a kind of cult movie, 1973. Michael Crichton, you know Mike Crichton? You know Jurassic Park and so on. Wonderful guy. We worked with him a couple of times in projects I was doing some years ago, sadly now deceased. Harvard MD, about six foot six, fascinating individual. Mike Crichton, it was the first movie he produced. Um, and uh, we now have this HBO series, which spins the whole thing. But this is the point. You, you basically have robot-looking people, uh, and you have vacation opportunities, and uh, there's a brothel, and you can also shoot them. <laughs> and that's, that's the basis of the whole enterprise. Point is, though, we are increasingly going to develop human-like machines. Already, Google, a few months ago, look it up if you didn't hear them, produced two sample telephone conversations made by robots that did not say, this is a robot, you know, by our... No, you cannot tell which is the human, which is the machine. And this is now. And telemarketing is number one on the list of jobs to go. And believe me, when I heard the Google tapes, I thought these Oxford guys are right. But what do you do when you're engaging with a non-human which or almost who has many of the engaging characteristics of a human? And I think it's, it is a non-trivial question, um, partly because we get drawn in. And you saw the movie Her, you know, about the guy who falls in love with this sort of Google voice, you know. Uh, Simone, you know, about the, the, the entertainer who basically is generated by, um, by, by computers. Um, we get drawn in. Bicentennial Man, you know, Robin Williams, a most wonderful film, a very moving film. The computer, the robot who wants to become human, wants to be recognized as human, and finally decides to die because he recognizes this is at the heart of the human condition. You've got to watch this stuff before you dismiss it as trivial. What do we do with the, with the engagement? We're going to have more and more intelligences with whom or with which we shall be engaging on this scale of you know, plainly the kind of voice you get on the, for the bank, you know, when you're trying to, you know, find out what's in your account, to recognizable voices and ultimately recognizable visual experiences of humanoids who seem to be patterned very strongly on us. Um, the other point to make about that is, um, whereas, you know, I, I mean, I'm in a group in Cambridge has been talking about some of this stuff, and one of the members is a professor, it's a computer science professor, uh, and he just keeps saying, but they're just computers. Uh, and we say, well, <laughs> actually, you know, hold on. Um, in Spielberg's movie AI, Artificial, Artificial Intelligence, I thought it was a pretty bad movie, but it's great for effects, being Spielberg. There's an extraordinary scene in a country fair where they are taking these old robots that are falling apart and destroying them for sport, like the Roman arena. Fundamental question, okay, maybe a robot shouldn't have rights. But if you are able to abuse machines that have been made to reflect aspects of the human condition, perhaps what you are doing is something which needs to be constrained. That is to say, maybe you shouldn't be able to torture humanoid robots. Not because in themselves they have value, but because they themselves are so deeply connected with 
those things which give humans value. If we're going to flourish, we have to resolve this. And thirdly, and uh, perhaps most dramatically, are we summoning the demon? Now, some of you may know who came up with this phrase, summoning the demon. It was Elon Musk. And Musk said this, that basically AI, we're maybe letting loose something we finally can't control. Now, this is not just Musk. Some of you will know, four years ago, was it? Open letter signed by an awful lot of people, including Musk, including Gates, including Stephen Hawking, before he, before he passed away, um, including um, Martin Rees, top British cosmologist, big, also big writer on risk issues, all saying AI could become an existential threat to the human race because the machines could take over, machines could run riot. Of course, the much easier problem is people misusing the machines. You know, like, you know, the, the famous story of the Jeep that was, that was hacked, you know, uh, um, and, and, you know, out of control. And it was staged by journalists, but it still went wrong. Um, the notion of hacking into systems which control people's lives and experiences, um, even if those don't go rogue. So the threat posed by these machines. And this might lead us to a concern for regulation. It certainly leads us to a concern to take risk very seriously. If we're to flourish as humans. Now, final word about flourishing before we stop. It all looks like doom and gloom. When things are changing fast, it's very easy and very proper to point out threats. This is, this is something we need to do very candidly and not cover them up and not pretend all is well when really it isn't. At the same time, we have to frame the conversation in the context in which these machines have hugely improved the human lot over the years. I mean, poverty is in decline around the world. Half the world can now connect with the internet, often very cheaply. Uh, education is now far more available and the advance of AI robotics is going greatly to enhance this whole process. And yet, it must be constrained in such a way that we remember. Yes, corporate profits are great. I'm all for corporate corporations to develop these things. Governments can use these things in all sorts of ways for policy purposes, defense, security purposes. We should be given great opportunities to extend our leverage around our own environments and our own lives using these technologies. And yet, unless human flourishing is at the center of our concerns, this will go wrong. Final remark. You know, the word robot comes from a Czech word. Roboto, which means a slave, basically a, a, bonded, a bonded servant. From a play, 1920, called Rossum's Universal Robots. Read the play and get it online. Robots are they're a bit more, more biological than mechanical in the, that, that version. Uh, read the play because it's subtle. The robots rebel and they kill most of the humans. Then they discover they need the humans to keep the robots going. Um, human flourishing becomes significant even for them. Thank you.